High Flyers, the show that gives you a 360 degree view of Asia's business elite. Today, we look at one family's enduring love affair with tea. A one small family business in Sri Lanka has grown into a global empire that supplies to more than 100 countries around the world. Let's meet the father and son team, Meryl and Dilhan Fernando. Meryl Fernando's dream was to be a tea master, despite that being a profession reserved in his youth for British colonial masters. But he succeeded and created the first ever producer-owned brand, Dilma. Sons Dilhan and Malik inherited their father's passion and the company is named after them. Time now for these high flyers to join us on the Singapore Flyer to tell us where the company goes next. Meryl, Dilhan Fernando, thank you so much for being on High Flyers. Oh, we're delighted to be on your program. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And Dilma has such an amazing story, but few people know that it took you 38 years for it to become a reality. In those 38 years, was there ever a time that you thought you weren't going to make it? Dilma was never going to be born. <laughs> There were more times that I felt I would make it than I felt I did, I could. So it was a huge task. Well, I don't know why I got the thought of getting into a field where which was multi, uh, dominated by multinational and rather giants in the trade. But it kept haunting me. And what I saw in my early years in Mincing Lane in London was that the future for producers was going to get even worse because Trade, tea trade had fallen into the hands of big traders and they were, as usual, exploiting the trade to enhance their profits. So I realized that our country would be, would get a, continue to get a raw deal. Therefore, I said, I wish I could take the finest tea on earth into the market and give the consumers an opportunity and an option to buy good tea. What was the most difficult part for you? Dilma was founded in 1988. You were 58. Yes, yes. It's never too late. No, that's true. That's what everybody, you know, I was planning for so long. I registered the brand in 1974. So from that point, at that point, I think I gained enough courage to do this. And so it took 14 years from that day to finalize. But I, I had to put in a lot of effort. The deal in Dilma is Dilhan. Yes. You were a young lad, I think of about six years old, when the family, when, when the company was born. What do you remember of those early days? Hard times. It was <laughs> uh, tough because, you know, even until comparatively recently, the um, trade that is in retail and even in hospitality didn't really understand tea to accept and embrace some of the concepts my father talks of. When you talk about single origin, you're celebrating the beauty of nature's influence on tea in a particular place, terroir. Now, if you look at the analogy with wine, you have the era of the red, white and rosé. Uh, we were in that era, but we were preaching chateau bottled, etc, etc. And it was simply going way over the heads of everyone we were talking to. So there was a lot, many, many years of frustration. So of course, when we were kids, we saw that in my father. And then, in fact, when my brother and I joined the business, until possibly, say, for the first 15 years, it was very similar. But it's only after a a lot of effort building competence, uh, sharing knowledge. We built a school of tea, we built our tea lounges, tea bars, and all really in the midst of a lot of disinterest. Um, that now the tide is changing because people are realizing what an amazing herb that tea is. Have you always loved tea, or was it dead who said, son? This is the business we're going to be in. You're going to be involved. <laughs> you know, the wonderful thing about tea, the more you know about it, the more it inspires passion. Because you see not only the effort, the artisanal effort that goes into making real tea. You see, for example, a tea maker that goes into a factory in the morning, they don't know what, there's no rule book, there's no guide. It's just, it's the expertise. How was the tea picked? What is the moisture? What is the weather conditions? All those factors makes it truly an artisanal herb. And then it is so varied. What you make this morning at, at six o'clock is not what you're gonna make the next morning. It's, it's, 
it's as changeable as the weather. It's, it's a beautiful herb in that respect. But most wonderfully is the fact that it offers protective benefits against every chronic or lifestyle disease of the 21st century, whether you look at stress. Tea protects 51%. That's University of London study in 2006. But if you look at some of the research that was published in December last year, really good, solid research, clinical studies, the impact of tea on everything from dementia to diabetes to stress, it has a solution tea in terms of wellness to really every problem that we face uh, in this century. So we should be drinking tea more often than we already are. Yeah, lots more. <laughs> Meryl, you talk about Mincing Lane in London. Yeah. That was when you spent two years as one of six tea tasters, the first batch of tea tasters yes. from Sri Lanka. Yes. You were trained. It was a privilege. Oh, yes, it was. I, I came from a middle class family. And at that time, tea tasting was considered the elite rich people's children's job. And dominated basically by the Brits. Yes. Uh, up to that point, the trade and the industry, urban plantations, both dominated by the Brits. And at that, in the, for many years, they refused to train Sri Lankans in Silanese at that time. In tea, they said, because they ate too much curry and hot spices, they cannot taste tea. <laughs> of course, they were, they, were, they were guaranteed their visas. So, <clears throat> when they finally selected six, I was one of them, and I wasn't. I was the most surprised in that lot. So fortunately, from then I picked up. Then I went to La Mincing Lane in London to learn about the marketing aspect of it. You spent your early years selling tea to the big MNCs. I supplied. Bulk tea, raw tea, and was a supplier, not a marketer, to all the big companies in the world, all the multinational big companies. And I provided them a damn good service, but worrying me. That would be the likes of what? Lipton, Tetley? Through their brokers. And uh, at that time, there were huge local companies like in Canada, Salada, and South Africa, two big companies, Joko and uh, Five Roses. I supplied them all, although they had their own agents in Colombo. As a small company, small operator and dedicated staff, I gave my customers a service that nobody could match. I used to buy tea in the auctions on Monday and Tuesday, and Saturday I would ship it. Whereas the big companies would take a month to ship. So through So your tea was fresh? Yeah, fresh and also through very hard work, I built up the tea business. So from a supplier, I became a marketer. I'm surviving today. If I remained a supplier, why would I be in broke by now? Uh, Dilan, Dilma is now available in about 100 or so countries. How would you like to grow the brand further? No, I think for us, it's not a question of being the biggest, but it is a question of being the best. So for us, it is about innovation, about bringing tea in new forms. We are working a lot with chefs around the world in tea gastronomy. We are working on different forms of integrating tea into a modern lifestyle through tea mixology, but always maintaining that respect for tea. For instance, well, we started an initiative which was very uh, probably considered uh, uh, quite brash, which is to reinvent the high tea occasion. If you consider afternoon tea or high tea, whatever you want to call it, uh, it is probably the most ubiquitous in terms of tea, something that everyone knows, but tea is really in every version I have seen, even the ones that you have to queue for three months in, in <laughs> London and pay 65 pounds, tea is, a, is, is an afterthought. You have a beautiful focus on cuisine. And you've tied up with the likes of W Hotel, Shangri-La. We do. We work with uh, the finest in hospitality because, of course, that's where people have the possibility to encounter. And when you consider um, a, a humble cup of tea, it has a potential to really tr be transformed in terms of trying to bring it into an experience, presenting you a tea, for example, not just saying, look, here's a cup of tea and here's a tea bag, but saying this tea is grown at this elevation. It has this characteristic, try the aroma, just see how that, and it pairs beautifully with this uh, chocolate or this, uh, whatever the food, canapé or whatever it is. So it's about transforming tea from simply a cup of tea that uh, might be two, three dollars or whatever it is into an experience. Coming up. And as I say, wine intoxicates, 
Die Heels. <lacht>And this is single estate tea, so that we don't sell any tea. Everything we sell is something special. It's and special of the best quality, quality, of course. Only, strictly, strictly, <laughs> strictly. Dilma doesn't know any other language, mm -hmm. only the top end. There is a way to appreciate tea. I mean, when the English or Singaporean were to sip tea, that's not actually the way to appreciate tea the best. That's correct? No. Well, the... <laughs> English made tea famous in our part of the world, but they also destroyed it by adding milk, <laughs> milk and sugar. The proper way to drink tea is black, right. straight black tea, no sugar, no milk. milk. And you get all the antioxidants, benefits and health in those. So I recommend that if you should want to drink, drink tea, Dilma with uh, milk and sugar, use only dairy milk and uh, fresh dairy milk and be sunny. And the water shouldn't be boiling as well, right? When you when you make tea, it should boil once, but then it should not be allowed to boil continuously because it loses the oxygen and the dissolved gases, and that's not good for tasting. Okay, shall we try? Yes. Well, it looks it yes. looks nice. See, this is the correct color, perfect taste of real, honest white tea. The perfect. Color, you said. Yes, yes. The color of tea and the taste, bright, light. You see the seasonal note. It's um, the floral, the softness that you you get in the aroma, and that's a seasonal character of the white tea. And it's just the bud. It's not the leaves, which is why it's so light and it's very rich in antioxidants. I've seen you drink tea in a different way than I do. I sip. Beautiful, but. You do, you have a technique. No, that's for tasting tea, not drinking tea. We, we enjoy tea just like you do. <laughs> so how, how do you taste the tea? Well, what does see, it involve? When you taste, when you sip, you get one dimension. You get the, the, the uh, appreciation of the tea on the palate. So you have the sweet, you have the sour, well, exactly this. But then if you take it to the next dimension, because when you taste tea, you need to really understand the personality. You need to understand any errors in the manufacture, any, any special characteristics. And so you have to aerate your olfactory system. So there's a thing called the olfactory bulb, which, which takes in the aroma. It's like, it's you know, technical. It's like, no, it's like <laughs> wine. It's the same principle. So then you slurp it, as my father just did, and you aerate the olfactory bulb and you get the second dimension. You talk, it's interesting, you, you draw comparisons with wine, you talk about tone, you talk about body, yeah. and increasingly tea is being associated with wine. Yes, because tea has the identical soil benefits, cultivation, climate, and the process of manufacture, both share the same, maceration, rolling, fermentation, drying, and fermentation. Until the a wine is served in a glass and tea is served in a cup, up to that point, everything is identical. And as I say, wine intoxicates, tea heals. <laughs> and, and, and you started a tea bar. Yes. You see, when you look at tea, your point a moment ago, 
the fact that like wine, tea is influenced by terroir means that every day you have a different tea. So today on uh, Craighead Estate, you're going to find in uh, the field in the shadow of the mountains, you're going to find a soft tea. Tomorrow you might find a brighter tea because simply the weather changed. Of course, the soil is, is static, but you have this confluence of other weather climatic conditions, the wind, the humidity, the intensity of light and so on that produces different tea. And from that you get infinite variety. So there's a tea for you for morning, for afternoon, for evening, but it's rarely that this is offered uh, to, to a tea drinker. Tea is crucial to the Sri Lankan economy. Yes. Three yes. percent of the land is used yes. to grow tea. Yes. Two and a half percent of the GDP, which amounts to yes. 60 billion dollars. Yes. and. It also hires or gives jobs to employer. two million. The large employer. And, and one million of them actually work on tea plantations. Yes, yes. Do you see the importance of tea growing even more in the coming years I for think Sri Lanka? In Sri Lanka, we have unfortunately, because of the plight of the tea industry today by exploitation, tea prices are not doing anybody in the plantations only the brand owners. Therefore, replanting ceased. Now we are trying to revive uh, replanting and promote Ceylon tea as the finest and get it, give it more publicity. We need tea around the world, good tea. And the good tea is now being respected and purchased by consumers. Mm -hmm. So Sri Lanka's economy depended for many years, largely depended on tea. In the last 20 years, it has changed, but yet it's a very important contributor to the economy. Well, Dilma sees a lot of opportunities in tea, and now is looking at tea tourism. I mean, you converted about four tea plantation bungalows to five-star guest accommodation, and that's called the Ceylon Tea Trails. What's the thinking behind that? Well, this is my brother Malik's uh, domain strictly, but I enjoy the place, so <laughs> I can okay, tell you a little brother. bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the concept is that in colonial times, the tea planters, they were, of course, mostly British and Scottish, they really enjoyed uh, an amazing life, surrounded by nature. It's pristine beyond belief. It's really a place that is, is to die for, as many of our guests say. And it's, it's beautiful cuisine, a lot of it tea-inspired, so it's cooked with tea as an ingredient, paired with different types of tea. Plus, you visit and you have an immersion experience in a tea factory with uh, one of the relatives of uh, James Taylor, the Scotsman who first uh, planted tea in Ceylon. So it's, it's a beautiful experience. Meryl, we've been talking about Scotsman. That brings me to my next question. The English breakfast tea wasn't English before it was Scottish. Yes, so I gathered in my early days in tea. Because in fact, it is under British rule, Scotsman who was sent out to open up the wild uh, land, elephants, leopards, bear, all that, uh, destroying them to open up the tea fields. And they enjoyed in the Dimula region of Sri Lanka, which produces full-bodied, beautiful, aromatic tea, they had a cup of tea called breakfast tea. Then they rightly named it Scottish breakfast. <laughs> Somehow it was later on usurped and it became English breakfast tea. How it became, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so it is misleading to think that the English brought tea to the world. Yeah, <laughs> I always say English brought tea to the Western world and really destroyed it by adding milk and sugar. That is the second part of it. <laughs> Coming up. Somebody gave me a plaque which says, be reasonable, do it my way. <laughs> Meryl, you've said before that to maintain the quality of the tea you produce at the Dilma brand, it has to remain a family business. Yes. So here in comes the next generation, like uh, your daughters and sons. How are they being trained? His son is being trained already, he's only 13. But, <laughs> they but, start young. Yes. <laughs> he started at six. Oh, wow. Yeah. He used to come to the tasting room and tell me, see, how can I taste that tea? So see, him means a grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I taste that cup of tea? Ooh, just like that. And then Malik's younger daughter 
will also get into T. So the third generation is now in safe hands. So I know eventually Dilma will survive many, many generations and continue to do the good work it is doing. What is the most difficult thing, the biggest challenge when running a family business? I think possibly for us. Do you disagree? Uh, no, I mean, of course, uh, <laughs> deba debate is always healthy because you always need to kind of refine and improve. But I think for us, the, the challenge will be to retain the soul and the, the, the DNA of the business as my father has defined. Because what is unique also, in addition to the fact that we are tea producers with the emphasis on quality, is the fact that Dilma is a business that is established as a, as a business of, of being a matter of human service. So in that sense, there is a very large amount of our global earnings that goes towards the MJ Foundation, towards uh, uh, sustainability at Dilma Conservation and so on. So you're talking sometimes upwards of six million dollars each year. Um, and the challenge would be for future generations to understand how integral that is to the DNA of the business and uh, one cannot succeed without the other and that is the philosophy. Um, but I think we're doing a good job of, of making sure that the next generation understand that. We, we have disagreements and arguments, but I'm quite reasonable. As, <laughs> as they Dad know, says he's because, reasonable. Yes, because I have, a, I have a little plaque. Somebody gave me, sorry, gave me a plaque which says, be reasonable, do it my way. <laughs> so Dad's always right. <laughs> there you go. When you look back, Meryl, how do you feel? I feel humbled by the success I have achieved. It was uh, not in my wildest dreams did I feel that we would build a business of this magnitude. And uh, equally, I never, never realized that I would be able to help thousands of people in the country to enjoy our success in the business. And every time when I ask the final question, how do you look back at this success? Quite honestly, I cannot explain my success. And for you, Dohan, what have you learned from your dad's journey and how has your own journey been? It's, um, it's been amazing because for, I think for my brother as well, to work with something like tea, that is, uh, you know, you can really feel uh, an evangelical zeal within you <laughs> because you know it's good for people. It's not, I mean, we, we feel really blessed because we are working with a, a herb that we can really hand on our hearts, say, look, this is honest, it's good for you, this is the beauty in it. And we're actually also able to, to pioneer new concepts, innovations and so on because tea is so varied in its uses. So I talked to you about gastronomy. We, we have tea with music, different styles, different styles of tea, and you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful wonderful to work with as a natural herb because of this aspect of terroir. But also the, what my father just mentioned about making business a matter of human service. Business is good and of course it's, it's good eventually you, if you're successful you see a few more zeros on your uh, balance sheet. But what is really good is when we go to our centers, we have centers around the country and you see a uh, mother of a child with cerebral palsy who comes and says look you know uh, my child is, is walking, my child has got its motor skills back or uh, um, we've got Down syndrome kids who've been taken or uh, having been locked up in rooms because the parents couldn't afford anything are uh, now getting jobs and completely we have uh, autistic kids who are taking their O levels maybe a few years later but you know who've been completely rehabilitated now that's really expresses to us the purpose of business tea with soul Meryl Delhan thank you so much for being on High Fly it's been such a pleasure thank, thank you, you for the opportunity <laughs> thank you thank you